morning, everyone. My name is Meredith Skatnik, and today I'll be talking to you guys about the kinematics of elite squash players in winning and losing rounds. So a really brief outline. I'll start off with an introduction, then go into some previous work done on similar topics, uh, then covering problem sta statement and objective, and methods, results, and conclusion. So a quick introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with squash. Essentially, squash is a racket sport that's played by two individuals in a four-wall court. So the players alternate hitting the ball against the walls, and the T of the squash court, which I'll be referring to later, is essentially where the, uh, the front line and the half court line meet. So very few studies currently exist on the kinematics uh, during squash matches. Previous work done on this topic uh, by Hughes and Frank in 1994, they found that elite squash players exhibit greater velocities and accelerations at the end of losing rallies. And they defined the end of losing rallies, or sorry, the end of the rally is the last 10 seconds of the rally. They also determined that winning players spend more time in front of the losing players. Um, they also kind of had like an old school retro system, so like, it's a little bit outdated. Uh, more recently, Biot in 2016, he developed a method to analyze previously recorded matches. So the method that Biot used utilizes Darkfish, which is video analysis software. It essentially tracks players' feeds in each frame of the video, and uh, you can find out the positional data of the players to export and convert to the proper coordinate system that we're looking for. And from that, you can then calculate the, den or the distance and velocity. So I'll show you how uh, Biot essentially used uh, the videos. So this is using Darkfish. So you can see using this software, you can place markers on each player's feet in each video frame. And the coordinates of each player's feet are shown up in the top left corner. So it's a semi-automatic process with frequent user intervention. Um, the coordinate of the left and right feet are averaged to approximate the player's overall position. And then once you have the player's position, you can export it, convert it to the plane of the squash, squash court, which is what we're looking for, then calculate the distance or velocity or acceleration or whatever you're looking for. So let's play it one more time in case you guys can catch it. You can see like it's tracking the player's feet and then the, the coordinates are up on the top left. So Biot studied elite, elite squash matches on a per-game basis. So he found that the distance traveled and velocity had no effect on the outcome of a game as a whole. He didn't look at player acceleration, and uh, he found that the game winner had a smaller average radial distance to the tee. So the tee that I mentioned there is this part of the court, which um, essentially means that players who exhibit that tee dominance, which they're spending more time at the tee, they're more likely to win a game. So it's actually very similar to tactics that are well known by squash players, uh, known as T-dots. And so Biot was the first person to uh, study the average radial distance to the T in elite squash. So just a little graph here. It shows the distance to the T uh, as a function of time. So the distance to the T follows a sinusoidal pattern. This essentially validates the T-dominance tactic that I mentioned earlier. It shows that one player is at a maximum distance from the T, while the other is at a minimum distance. So that's kind of similar to the nature of squash, which means that one player will be leaving the preferred position at the tee to return the ball, while the other player will be moving towards the tee to anticipate returning that next shot. And then, so our study. So we got, in 2016, found no correlation between the winner and loser of the game and their velocity and acceleration in the game, but we thought that this might be due to the fact that the matches are analyzed by whole games. So that means that if a match is, if a game is really close, that's including both the winning and losing rallies for each player. So we thought, what if we looked at the player kinematics uh, by each rally individually? So our objective was to analyze the same elite squash matches used by, by Biot to determine if player velocity and acceleration have an impact the outcome of the rally. Essentially, do winners of a rally display like higher, lower velocity and acceleration? The methods we used, just a really brief overview, we used the same positional data from the five matches that Yacht used. We divided these into rallies and determined uh, if the rally was won or lost. Applied filters to the positional data to smooth any jumps or errors or fluctuations. And then we calculated and analyzed velocity and acceleration for each rally individually. So these are the games that Yacht analyzed. Um, five different squash matches between elite squash players. They ranged from world rank one to world rank 53. 
and all of the videos were obtained through the Professional Squash Association website. The first step that we did, uh, we divided the match data into rallies. So they were divided using an algorithm in Excel. If the time gap is exceeded five seconds, we assumed it was the end of the rally and the beginning of a new rally. Uh, we recorded the winner and loss, or the winner and loser of each rally, and then any likes were disregarded. The next thing we did, we applied filters to the positional data. So we used four different filters to reduce the noise and uh, any fluctuations, and so we could calculate acceleration. We applied two Gaussian filters and two moving average filters, and they gave us essentially five sets of data, including the one that had no filter applied. So you might be asking, what's the point of applying these filters? The filters, like I said, are to smooth the positional data and reduce any noise or fluctuations. So non-smooth positional data leads to really big errors in the first derivative, which is velocity, and then even larger errors in the second derivative, which is acceleration. So if you look at this graph here, you can see that the, un the unfiltered position is the blue line, the velocity is the green line, and then the acceleration is the red line. So as you can see, it's like jumping all over the place, um, it's not super meaningful if, as it is unfiltered. However, when we apply the filter, um, smoothing the positional, positional data reduces the noise and fluctuations and creates a much, much smoother velocity and acceleration curves. So you can see now the velocity and acceleration are much more desirable, and we can actually use them to analyze the things. And then so once we applied those filters, we then calculated the acceleration using the centered finite difference. And moving on to our results, essentially we determined that the velocity and acceleration of winners and rallies are less than that of the losers of the rallies for all the filters. So using the filtered data, the velocity and acceleration were a little bit lower than the unfiltered data because of the smoothing we had to do. Um, but the trend remained the same for all of them. So for all sets of data, the velocity and acceleration of the winners is less than the velocity and acceleration of the losers. And our conclusion. So like I said, the winner of a squash rally has lower average velocity and acceleration. The filters we applied lower the average velocity and acceleration, but despite lowering these velocities and acceleration, the trend still holds true for all the different filters applied. And does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Moses. Um, so why do you think the velocity and acceleration is lower for the winners? That's a really good question. Um, so I guess it comes back to looking at the tactics of the squash players. Um, I think maybe it has to do with the tactic of someone, I guess, utilizing the whole court and making their player kind of run around them. So if one player is controlling the game, um, they would probably be more centered in the team and making their player move at the front, the back, like all over to in an effort to kind of tire them out or to force them to make errors. So in that sense that they would have a lower velocity and acceleration than their losing opponent. Yeah, that seems to agree with that other paper that I was saying. They hang out closer to the key. Yeah, exactly. It kind of goes hand in hand next to uh, How do you think these might compare to amateurs? Well, I just started playing squash myself, and I can say well, from personal experience that um, I don't have any time. <laughs> really, I'm running all over the court. So, I mean, players who are in, a, in control, they're, these are professionals, they're very elite players. They know what they're doing. They know how to retire their uh, opponent out. They know where to place the ball. Um, whereas someone who's less experienced probably is not as familiar with that type of tactic. Um, and I think it would be harder to find that correlation. Um, because there'd be a lot more variability. I think it would be, yeah, exactly. It's a lot more random in that sense. Like, when I play squash, I, it's different to time I play. I have no one set tactic, so.
just for a different square. Yeah, exactly. Because I know in football games you get lots of statistics, heat maps, um, um, the, uh, the mileage that's covered by each player. We get we get some amazing stuff out. Of it. Like are you saying using the same methods that we use? I'm not sure if it's the same methods or not. I don't know what methods they use. But. Well, I mean. I think that the method that we use could probably be applied to a lot of different sports that has that video recording. Um, so essentially all that we did is we took the videos that are already recorded, like we did in the special, we just then put it into Dartfish, tracked the player movements, and then uh, converted it to the coordinate of the, the court. Um, so theoretically we should be able to do that with any sport, whether it's like a football match, squash match, whatever. Thank you. So what would you use this data for? Like how would you I can answer this question. <laughs> um, I mean, at the very high levels, I don't think maybe this isn't something that's very important to them. I mean, they have their strategy and tactic already set out, so it might not be as useful to them. Um, I think it's useful as a player. It kind of shows that, I guess, you know, going back to the T is like a really important strategy to use. Um, I think it, I don't know, maybe it's not super important to other people, but I think it is very interesting that it does really nicely with tactics that are well known, such as the team dominance or um, you know the having more control of the game and making your player work the other player work more. So I mean, take it how you want it. I don't know if you could actually be like, okay, I need to lower my velocity acceleration and then I'm gonna win. Like I don't think people would use it like that, but it's something to consider when you're deciding your strategy. Well Meredith doesn't know the story if you have to jump in, but um the, one of the players that you watched here, he's number two at the time he was number two in the world and I sent him one video showing his footwork, and he was extremely excited. He actually wanted this, he wanted all the information. He wanted me to send him everything, because for him, he, he, he didn't know how he moves. So it's like it could be a coaching tool or whatnot. Yes, and, and they also asked me, uh, the, I, I mean, it's not my, they, it's their work, but I, I took that work and I went to a, a camp, a squash camp, and I presented that work for some of the junior squash players. So it's for for training purposes. Thank you, Mother.